Good afternoon. My name is Dave Jokum. I'm the Director of Business and Membership Development with the Longview Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you to this webinar this afternoon, <clears throat> 10 Things You Need to Know About Data Security and Working Remotely. Um, we want you to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online at longviewchamber.com. Uh, those of you listening live to this webinar will receive an email uh, later today or in the morning with a link uh, so that you can listen to it again, watch it again, and or share it with others, which we encourage you to do. A um, couple of housekeeping uh, items. You will be muted throughout the presentation, but you'll be able to listen to the presenters and see the visual presentation provided. Uh, if you do not see currently the green and white title screen, uh, look at your toolbar, typically at the bottom of your computer, there should be a GoToWebinar icon there. It looks like a little flower. Sometimes you need to click on that in order to see the screen. Uh, and then uh, finally, even though you are muted, this is an interactive webinar. And so there is a questions section on the menu to the right of your screen. And uh, you can feel free to type questions there at any time throughout the presentation. And then we'll, uh, we'll work through those questions when the presentation is over. Uh, so again, welcome to this, this webinar. We're glad to have you as a part of it. Uh, the Longview Chamber of Commerce has done these for the last several weeks now. We started planning back in only early March uh, with, with uh, what was to come. We, we saw what was on the horizon and we wanted to be prepared. And we wanted to be able to be in a position to help our businesses be prepared as well uh, for this season. So uh, we know we don't have all the answers, but thankfully we have access to experts in different areas who can provide you with a place to start, maybe get you a starting point for some of the answers you need. Today, our professionals are with Synergy Technology. Synergy serves the East Texas area, Longview and Tyler, to provide technical solutions and management for businesses. And so we have COO Kevin Roper as the main presenter, along with Jesse Lazenby, Brent Hudson, and Keith Bailey, owner operator. So we're thrilled to have these guys with us today. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Dave. Let me get my screen situated. Okay, let's begin. Uh, a few housekeeping notes, if I may. Uh, first of all, great thank you to the Chamber for organizing this and giving us the opportunity to participate. Uh, knowing where to go for accurate information those of you that are quite aware, there's a blizzard of opinions out there that we find ourselves in, and it can be challenging finding good information. So this is a critical community service that the chamber is providing. Also, thank you to everyone signed in today. I know it's been a crazy few weeks, uh, but one of the best things we can do for our organizations and people in them is to keep communicating. So uh, kudos to you for staying on that front line. Joining me from Synergy are Brent Hudson and Jesse Lazenby. Both are VCIOs within our managed services group who work uh, on a daily basis with some of the most advanced and progressive organizations in the region. And both are experienced business strategists and both have extensive technology backgrounds, which will be very important during the live Q&A. Uh, they may be commenting throughout the presentation and certainly during the Q&A that follows. On a quick personal note, please remember that many in our community are confused, afraid, and hurting, especially financially. Uh, if you're weathering the storm with only minor changes, be very thankful and take a minute to reach out to people in your community that are not so lucky. Uh, if this situation is seriously impacting your business or life, please ask for help. Uh, there are many of us that just want a name and a need. Uh, everyone say an extra prayer for our nation and the rest of the world that this will pass quickly. Uh, the goal for our time is to talk about 10 things that will either be an opportunity or a potential issue to your organization, uh, both during COVID-19, but maybe, and maybe more importantly, after it's over. Uh, we want you to have some resources to know that uh, many of the things we're gonna discuss are very simple things to implement. And finally, if you need help, uh, please call us at Synergy. We've been doing this for 40 years, and we can certainly be of assistance. Okay, 
Uh, these are in no particular order, but let's start with this. Um, do take advantage of the tools that are out there. If you Googled tools for remote workers lately, there are literally hundreds of lists of free and paid tools uh, that are available and they are everywhere on the internet. Um, use these connectivity tools to your advantage to keep your, your, your uh, clients and your employees in contact and to keep business process flowing. But like any tool, uh, watch the best practices and the way you use it. And if you don't know what the best practices are, please get help from a reputable IT provider, from your internal IT folks. For example, Zoom meetings are a hot topic today. And if you read the news, you may hear warnings about Zoom video conferencing. In fact, there are some large organizations, including a couple of big educational facilities that have recently banned its use entirely. But again, this is like any tool. If you use it incorrectly or unsafely, you get bad results. It works great if you follow best practices. So talking about Zoom or any video conferencing service, you want to be sure to download the latest client. You don't want to publish the meeting number or the private password to public forums. I have to mention this because there are some students that actually did this in order to interrupt their own class. So uh, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Be sure and add passwords and waiting rooms to all of your meetings. That will, that will help and, and cut down on some of the problems. Uh, interestingly enough, Zoom is aware of this and they have just made passwords and meeting rooms the default for new meetings. There are many other tools, GoToMeeting, the one that we're on, and, and a host of others. Okay, second, don't use shared computers. Okay, um, this is equally true for USB thumb drives that you have around the house. Be very, very careful with them. Family computers, a lot of times, have already been compromised. USB drives may already be infected. That funny cat video that the kids clicked on or the free app that your spouse downloaded a month ago. Hackers love viral videos and free downloads for carrying things that you didn't know were there. Uh, for example, if a hacker has installed a keystroke logging package on your unsecure family computer or USB drive, they can get the login and password to your most sensitive business systems as you use that computer uh, to access those systems. So use a business computer, have your IT department or vendor inspect your home computer before you use it. Have the USB drive thoroughly inspected before you plug it in, okay? And IT departments and vendors will know what to look for. They're gonna go out and make sure that the antivirus is fully patched and operating systems have security enabled, uh, connections to the, up, to the internet uh, that are secure, and your files are scanned and tested. Okay, this one's, this one's a little interesting because people don't tend to think about it very much, but don't print sensitive documents unless you can immediately secure them. And if you have to print them and you, you need to throw them away, be sure that they get shredded. Okay, as we go through this list, I want you to notice how many of these recommendations are really common sense things. You wouldn't use a computer without an updated antivirus in your workplace. You also wouldn't print sensitive material and leave it in the break room in the office. Uh, this risk, much like some of the others, is underestimated when we start working remotely because it's our home and it's a safe place and a comfortable place. And because of that, the risk for critical data to get out in the open is pretty high. Uh, failing to control a sensitive printed, printed documentation while working remotely at your dining table is really no different than taking a secure file from the workplace and leaving it spread out at the local library. It's just a common sense prevention. Okay, here's another don't. We will get to a couple of do's in a minute, but don't broadcast telephone calls. Be careful uh, as you're working remotely about the conversations that you're having on the phone. You, you don't want to discuss patients or clients or workforce members where anyone else can hear confidential information. Uh, again, it's a common sense thing for the office, 
but it could be overlooked in a living room, all right? And we need to treat every business conversation as confidential and make sure that the space that we're using is very private. This is a big one. Watch the email scams. Let me give you a couple of fairly startling statistics. Google has recently reported a 350% jump in malware attacks. And phishing scams are up 667% in one month. This morning, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Cyber Crime and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the UK's National Cyber Security Center released a joint global warning. And here's a brief quote from that. Groups are using COVID-19 pandemic as part of their cyber operations. These cyber threat actors will often masquerade as trusted entities, and their activity includes using coronavirus-themed phishing messages or malicious applications that may have previously been compromised. Cyber criminals are using the pandemic for commercial gain, deploying a variety of ransomware and other malware. Look, as frightening as that may sound, here's the good news. We need some. Protecting yourself against it is relatively simple. Don't fall for email scams that ask for money transfers, sensitive information, gift card purchases, payroll deposits, without talking to the person making the request to verify. We heard this many times as a business prior to COVID-19 and the uh, number of cases is on the uptick. Before you open an email, ask yourself a simple question. Was I expecting this email from this person today? And pay special attention to any email containing a link. Some of the worst data disasters that we deal with start with a single click in the wrong place. And here's a tip. Uh, if the email does contain a, a link, hover over it. Don't click it, just hover. Many times you'll get a small pop-up box that'll tell you what the link is going to do if you click it. And is that a place that you really wanna go? Biggest piece of advice when dealing with email phishing and malware scams, slow down, okay? We need people to concentrate and think about what they're doing uh, before they open it or before they click on it. Kevin, I would like to add a little bit extra on that slide. Not only it, uh, do we have to worry about work email, but since you are working at home, more often than not, that computer has access to home email, which more than likely doesn't have anywhere near the security or filtering capabilities that your work email has been uh, installed with. Good information. Okay, with those things, uh, here is a do. Be sure that you do log off your computer. We, you know, we talked about getting too comfortable at home with shared computers and phone conversation and printed material. This is another common sense practice that you should already be doing when you're in your office space. You need to do the same thing at home. If you walk away from a computer, even for a minute, which likely will turn into 10 to 20 minutes, uh, don't leave sensitive information on the screen or critical business systems open and logged in. I do full hour cybersecurity training all over the East Texas region. One of the consistent questions I get from employers and employees is this. Is it okay to leave my computer on or logged in in my locked office overnight? Okay, the answer is no. Here's the problem. It's the access that you didn't expect that will compromise your business, okay? The person on the nightly cleaning crew with a key, uh, the coworker who is about to quit and would like to take key information with him or her, and here's one for the home, the child who just wanted to watch the Disney Channel and hit the wrong button, okay? Be sure that your workstation is secure if you are not on it. All right, let's talk about some security measures. We do want you to use secure connections uh, to provide end-to-end -end encryption of the data in transit. And this can be a VPN, stands for Virtual Private Network. Um, IT guys love acronyms, so let me make this uh, simple with a picture. Think of yourself trying to move $10 million from one place to another. 
uh, yes, you could put that in the back seat of your Ford and drive it to the bank, and it may or may not get there safely if someone else knows about it. Or you could put it in an armored truck that's driven by people with machine guns. Okay, VPNs add that additional security and privacy as you move mission critical data. Uh, most firewalls that are good and up to date and current uh, will have some VPN capabilities if they're set up and tested correctly. Get with your IT folks. What if I don't have a VPN? Okay, there are security filtering companies that will verify web connections. Uh, stay off public Wi Fi. You should be staying off public Wi Fi anyway. And <laughs> stop. I, I can't believe I need to say this, but stop using your neighbor's unsecured wireless signal. Uh, and you know who you are. I've run into that more times than I can count uh, with people laughing during the cybersecurity presentation. So I know it happens. Uh, update security, security on your home network. If you're using Wi-Fi, you need to be able need to be using WPA2 encryption if you can. Uh, change the login on your router if possible. And if you're not using a home firewall, this might be a really really good time to start using one. Another note on that as well, uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier, this is Brent, by the way. Uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier about logging off when you step away from your machine, that's what goes with the same uh, with your VPN at the end of the day. Uh, when you're done at the end of the day, just right click on that little icon down at the bottom and say disconnect. Uh, what that prevents is that live connection being connected over through the night. If someone sits down at the computer and decides to do some research on something else, that traffic's not being transmitted back over the corporate network. Uh, so make sure that you're discon disconnecting from that VPN when you're done with it. All right. Um, one of the things that we need to talk about just briefly is the most effective weapon in the hacker's arsenal, and it's not technical, it's actually social. Okay, socially engineered hacking. Here's a good definition. It's hackers using what they know about you and your habits to get you to give them information that they should not have so that they can make money from it, okay? And here are three things, let me give you an example. Uh, here are three things, simple things, that I know about you at work, but maybe more at home, that would help me to steal your money. One, I know that you move too fast. Uh, your world is running at 150 miles an hour, and there is rarely enough time in your 24-hour day to get accomplished what you need to accomplish. Uh, two, I also know that you're distracted. You have two incoming calls and 20 unanswered emails and two kids and three pets climbing on you right now. Uh, your attention is divided. And here's the third thing I know. I know that you consume information using technology one click at a time. It's a very click-driven consumption. So this is one place that I can offer you some totally free advice that may help you. Uh, slow down. That's one. Uh, autopilot right now, bad thing. Turn off the cruise control. Ease up on the pedal. We, we just need to slow down the pace a little. Uh, two. Uh, try doing one thing at a time for a while. You know, the call will go to voicemail, the emails, most of them will wait. Um, just concentrate on what you're doing at the moment. And three, don't click until you think through it. Again, hover first before you click on things. Uh, Cybercrime, by the way, is a multi-trillion dollar, but trillion with a T business. And COVID-19 is not an obstacle to people who want to steal from you. It is a a huge, huge opportunity. Okay, do talk to your IT department or if you have a managed service vendor or other IT vendor about security measures. You wanna be asking about things uh, that are not normal conversation like VPNs, uh, multi-factor multi authentication, email encryption, backup and disaster recovery, let me just say this, uh, if the person you're talking to is having difficulty explaining it using human words, um, find, find someone that can. It, it's understandable, it just needs to be explained. Here's the good thing, uh, some of your IT people or your managed service providers have probably been trying to talk to your businesses about uh, 
security and backup and VPNs for years. We're going to be very happy when you're ready to discuss it. So uh, look forward to a, an animated conversation. Uh, remember, it, it, a, a last piece on this, it's not just your company's security that you should be asking about. But if you have vendors, third party vendors that connect to your systems remotely in order to provide support, you need to be asking them the exact same security questions and listening very carefully to their answers. All right. This one is not a technical thing, but it is a huge truth and maybe the most important slide we have. Uh, we're working from home because there is a global health pandemic. And the fact is that some of our employees could get sick and worse things could happen during this crisis. Uh, with that in mind, community chats, uh, video tools, anything that, that helps us create a sense of team during this time is increasingly important, not just for getting business done, but for people's mental health particularly for anyone enduring a quarantine. Uh, I heard of a group of people that are working remotely and they're using a home exercise app and group FaceTime to exercise together during the day, uh, which they believe helps them boost the team feeling while they're working remotely. You know, these are great communication tools, but it isn't a replacement for concern for the team. So keep the phones and emails lit up on daily check-ins with your staff. Uh, you watch employees' Facebook accounts. People are posting right now and sharing because they feel that need more than ever, and you can learn a whole bunch of things about what's going on with them. Uh, comment, like things. It, it says, you know, I care and I, I understand what you're going through. Uh, if someone gets sick, Please double your communication effort because a sniffle right now is an extremely scary deal, okay? If you do have a sick employee, the, the entire office, frankly, ought to bomb them with, with um, communications to let, let them know that they're being thought of. Uh, keep your employees updated. If you read something useful, business-related or not, uh, Synergy and, and, and the owners have, here have done an excellent job of doing that with the staff. If you read something that's interesting, send it on, okay? And here's the bottom line is that people are likely to be under a, a great deal of personal stress, uh, so it makes perfect sense to raise each other up uh, as we go through this journey. Now, I do want to give you, and again, you, you have a link to all of my slides, all of the the notes that I wrote for this. So a lot of the things that uh, we've gone through very quickly are available in that. Uh, one of the things that's gonna be available is this slide. It's just an example of many hundreds of good locations that you can go to get accurate information. Uh, the first one, US CERT, that's a, a federal government um, entity has great information on defending against hijacking and, and how to set up Zoom. Uh, PC Magazine, which is a, a trade technical uh, journal, you know, is talking about the 350% attacks during COVID-19. USA Today, uh, so reputable uh, newspapers and news outlets, um, the, the viral attacking scams and, and identifying some of those. Uh, Tripwire is an online resource talking about the COVID-19 scams. So you can, you know, if you know what to look for, uh, it's very difficult to get fooled. And then Stay Safe Online, which has been out there forever, has created a COVID-19 security resource library that, it, that is really good. So uh, try to avail yourselves of all of these tools in order to stay current. Okay, the last piece that I'll give you is this. We've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, we've been helping people work remotely, helping people through uh, technology crisis situations and helping them strategize what they need in to do technically in order to move their businesses forward for a long time. Uh, so we can certainly help. You know, reach out to us. If it's a piece of information that we can give you and, and help you out, uh, we're more than happy to do that. Uh, when we get the dust settled, 
uh, call back and let's talk about some things that we can do to move your business forward. But right now, uh, let us help you keep those processes and communications open and flowing. Okay, with that, I'm going to switch back, give you a camera shot, and I'm going to join Jesse Lazenby, who will be on your left in the white shirt, Brent Hudson on the right in the gray shirt. I'm going to join them, and we are going to open the floor. I hope this has been helpful to you. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We're going to open the floor for those questions. All right. Thank you guys very much for uh, just awesome information that, that we all need to be very, very aware of and mindful of. Um, we have a question about Zoom, and you may have alluded to this early on, but if you could speak to it some more. Um, Zoom in particular has had some security issues, and uh, could you just speak to whether or not it's a safe platform for people to be using now, or, or what, what should be their concerns there? Go ahead and take that. Well, certainly. Well, I think, you know, just like any other tool uh, that you're using to communicate with, whether it be email, uh, Facebook, social media, et cetera, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're securing that connection before its use. I think the problem with with Zoom initially was the ease of use uh, to get quickly connected when you needed to. Uh, and a lot of times the, the security features that are built into that available uh, were not uh, initially turned on when the meeting was set up. So the best thing to do is when, if you are using that tool as uh, as a medium for communication, just to take that extra step when you're configuring that initial setup to enable the waiting room and uh, password settings, et cetera. I think a lot of, from what I've read, a lot of the security issues that I've run into from Zoom uh, were from uh, people using the tool incorrectly. You know, we always say uh, that, you know, never post uh, or use anything of that situation uh, open in an open format like that, that you're not willing to post on a billboard uh, on the North Loop in, in Longview or South Loop in Tyler. Uh, if it's not something out there that you want uh, publicly uh, communicated, then you probably need to look at securing that down using the mediums that are the feature sets that are in there as far as securing that with, with waiting room and passwords. And a lot of those settings, you can find them in the, the setting up your Zoom meeting and just click on the advanced section and it can go through a lot of those different things and they're very, it's fairly self-explanatory and, and, and very easy to enable. Yeah, a couple of quick additions. Uh, Zoom has already enabled two of the most important, which are the meeting waiting room, and I believe the use of passwords as a default. In other words, you'll have to go in and turn them off if you don't want to use those. Wouldn't recommend doing that right now. Uh, one of the interesting things from the reports that came out that Zoom was not safe, uh, which didn't get followed up until much later, they had uh, some instances of kids that were in online classrooms and the classrooms got Zoom bombed uh, by someone who was was not supposed to be there posting information they shouldn't have posted. Well, as it turns out, in many of these cases, the kids had posted in public forums the passwords and the meeting IDs in order to create a disruption and cause the class to get disrupted and then possibly canceled. So, Again, sometimes we're our own worst enemy, and uh, the use of the tool correctly will prevent a, a large majority of these things. We use Zoom internally, and we, we use it uh, every week for an all-staff meeting and never have an issue, but we use the, we use the tool correctly. Good, good information. Okay, the next question is, uh, is this, is Microsoft Teams a HIPAA compliant program? Not in of itself. Um, there are versions of Microsoft Office 365 that are HIPAA compliant. You'll have to make sure that your the, the type of licensing that you're using is. Now, uh, keep in mind, when you when, from an internal use standpoint, it, I'm speaking in the external uh, use uh, medium of that standpoint. So uh, internally, uh, it's as secure as, as your network is going to be from that from that standpoint. Yeah. Okay. 
in terms of uh, companies, organizations that use a lot of cloud type services or, you know, uh, whether it's data um, management or other things that they do through a website somewhere, are there specific issues that they need to be aware of, things they need to be looking out for, for their protection? Because these are things that an employee could log on to from home um, and not directly impact the server for the organization. Right, right. So most cloud services, depending on how they're configured, the organization owns the remote server uh, and the, the provider uh, is mainly just responsible for the infrastructure itself. So it depends on how the cloud service is configured. Uh, on another note, though, it depends also on the device that you're connecting from. Uh, as Kevin alluded to earlier, if you're using a, a shared computer that could have potential malware on it, a, key, a keyboard or keystroke logger, for example, uh, what key loggers do basically is they keep track of key punches. So, uh, and those are configured as text files and sent out to whoever the malicious uh, attacker is. So, uh, which is usually usernames, passwords, etc. So. Uh, that's why we stress making sure that your antivirus is up to date, making sure that your security patches are up to date. Uh, again, just making sure that you're you're doing your due, due diligence on the system side from, from that. In addition to that, you really need to pay attention to all of the above, and including the version of the browsers that you're using, whether you've got the most current up-to-date Firefox or Chrome or Opera or Internet Explorer. They are nearly multiple times a week in some instances, coming out with security updates and making sure that those are applied and your browser is uh, closed and reopened so that they can actually be applied and not just downloaded and started. On Again, on the security issue, um, you mentioned obviously that one of the most uh, uh, prevalent things is the phishing scams through emails and getting you to click on something you don't need to click on. Um, what are some other ways? You mentioned the keystroke thing. Um, how does that even work? How do, do they know what, like they can tell exactly what you're typing, the words you're typing out or what? Yeah, so what, what happens with keystroke logging is I get you to click on something and you download a package and you install it. The package installs correctly. It is what you wanted to download, but it carried with it a piece of baggage, that being the keystroke logger. That installed in the background, you never knew it happened. And what it does is it sits there and it waits for you to type on the keyboard. And as you type, it actually delivers keystroke by keystroke what you type to an offsite uh, web location. Uh, so that person is collecting everything that you you type. So if you go in and you type uh, login credentials for a business critical system, uh, they have that. If you type your personal uh, PIN number for your financial organization, they have that. So it's, once it gets installed, it is very, very invisible. In fact, I'll, I will tell you this quick story about how effective this can be. Uh, there was a major petroleum company that wanted to do some testing of its network security. And so they hired a company to come in and test their security. And rather than attacking the technology, the company attacked the people. They showed up at a parking lot before a major shift change with a bag full of USB drives. They dropped those USB drives in a parking lot scattered them around. USB drives were preloaded with a keystroke logging uh, software and an automated installation package. But when you looked at it, it didn't look like it had anything else on it. Human nature says when you step out of your car with a, with a Starbucks and you see a brand new key, uh, USB drive sitting in the parking lot, what do you do? Well, you pick it up. And many of them did, took it in, plugged it into the internal network, keystroke loggers automatically installed. And for three weeks, that company connected, uh, collected nearly every piece of information necessary to fully compromise almost any system on that network, including personal information, protected medical information. They collected everything. Uh, luckily for that company uh, that, that was hit that way, they had hired that company. And, but it, it it's not the technical attack 
that's so difficult. What makes phishing and malware work so well is they're using what they know about us to get us to give them information. This is why training is so important for your staff. Uh, cybersecurity training, making sure that everyone understands how these processes work and how these uh, malicious uh, actors, uh, how they, what they do and how they act um, in order to get in, because that's uh, uh, keeping informed is the best way to keep your keep yourself and your organization safe. Uh, they they call it the human firewall. Basically, you can spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on technology to keep your network safe. But all it takes is one one uh, person to click on something uh, that and and let the bad guys in. So that's why it's uh, always good to be have your due diligence to make sure that you're taking care of and training your folks as well. And these are all rules that are not only apply to remote workers, but when we return back in house, you know these things should be followed and 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 followed up on, and and the training uh, should be effective. But now that we've got everybody disparate and everybody is distracted and everybody is, is going in 90 miles an hour or 150 miles an hour, as Kevin alluded to earlier, uh, this, this makes the, that attack uh, angle even more prevalent. Yeah, and these guys are, are sick, uh, I'll be quite honest. Uh, they're sending out emails that basically, uh, the, the source of the email basically says, hey, we have a report that one of your family members has been infected. Please click the link below to find a, a testing center closest to you. That's all it took is just clicking on that one link and, and then their system was infected with whatever they had attached to it. So uh, if you're not sure of the source, just delete it. Pick up the phone, call whoever you think sent it. So, hey, did you send this? Is this, you know, uh, that's the best way to uh uh, to get around. Well, and I'll, I'll give you a prediction with the round of stimulus funding coming out and information being disseminated about checks, uh, people that are financially strapped and worried and concerned and afraid are going to be looking for communications on their stimulus money. Wait for it. The, yep. the, hackers, the hackers know this is coming and they've probably already prepared the attacks as soon as those things start uh, coming that out. That has already started in the UK. Yep. In fact, that uh, alert that came out from the Homeland Security this morning uh, had a screenshot of a text message uh, from the UK that looked like it came from a government entity uh, that said, you know, stimulus money is coming. Uh, click on the link below to find when it's coming in your area. And the link infected malware on the phone uh, basically uh, uh, stealing contacts and everything else off of it. So uh, if you're not sure of the source, you're better off just deleting it. Okay. How, how often do you recommend cybersecurity training for a team? As, as often I mean, how frequent should it be? Well, and Go ahead, Brent. I think from a training standpoint, it, it's not a situation where you, you have to get everyone in a room right. all at the same time. Uh, there are tools out there that you can schedule training on a case by case basis and say, hey, I need you to go watch these online videos, these source you know, training, uh, and you've got three weeks to get it done. OK, and that way uh, they can do it in their downtime. They can go through and do that whenever. And you can schedule that out either quarterly, monthly, however you need to. Uh, it's also a good idea to perform regular phishing tests. And when I say phishing test, I'm sending a an email from a trusted source that prompts them to click on something. And when they do click on it, then immediate training and feedback says, okay, you shouldn't have clicked on this and here's why. So you're training your staff on how to look at an email and determine where uh, if it's valid, you know, how to hover over links, look at the email address where it came from. I know it says Brent Hudson, but the email address is not really his. So I don't, I'm not sure if that really came from him. And, and just going through and looking at that and, and doing that ongoing training on a regular basis to keep everyone up to speed is the best method. Because if you do it annually, they're going to forget it within the first week. Uh, you're, if it's repetitious, then it's more to stick and it keeps them going. And 
and you know you can create you know, there are tools out there too that you can create a, a game internal and you just say okay this department you had you know zero clicks this month yay you know <laughs> or so forth uh, you can do it that way too so from a training standpoint it's really better to have an ongoing process of training uh, and, and and keep it in front of them uh, because that's really the only way that uh, they're going to uh, maintain it and retain it. Good. So, so that that sounds like it's just a matter of we need frequent re reminders. So it can't be yes. a one and done. Oh, we did that a year and a half ago, so we're right. good. Yeah. Right. right. And it's a, right. and it's the same with your with, with your internal documentation. You know, if you do have a cybersecurity policy internally, uh, review that on a monthly, quarterly basis with your with your leadership, making sure that it's still up to date. Uh, you know, are you doing, do you have a business continuity plan? What happens if we get infected by malware? Are we still able to, to operate? Do we have disaster recovery pieces in place to be able to, to recover data in the event of a crypto attack of some sort? Uh, these are things that you need to be outlining ahead of time. It's a lot easier to outline a process and be ready than having to wait until it happens and then trying to figure out do we have everything we need? This should be an ongoing conversation, at least on a quarterly basis from your leadership uh, uh, group, just making sure that you have everything you need in place. And that includes not only just the IT functions, but that includes how are we gonna switch over phones? Who's gonna man those? Where are we going to set up? You know, what kind of other processes did we need to have from, you know, uh, you know manual pro internal procedures to, to you know, just, Continuity, who's going to make announcements of where those changes, who needs to be informed? Right. So it's much further and more broad reaching than just the IT and getting systems back online. Yeah, this is business continuity as a whole. Uh, you know, do I have the critical forms that I need to continue to operate? Do I have printed copies? You know, what happens if the server goes down or something happens uh, for a short period? If I have the forms, the, the critical forms that I need printed out that I can continue to gather information and do what I need to do to stay operational uh, until that system can be restored and, and built back up again, uh, you know, that's that's part of your, your business continuity plan. All right, I think I've got one final question here. Um, companies that you work with, uh, that you would obviously, you know, go in and, and do some of this type of training and stuff. Uh, do any of those companies ever have you also uh, help their employees uh, with this type of training for use at home? Uh, especially, I would imagine they, they would, especially if they have people working remotely, but is that something that companies sometimes will do? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, usually what we do is, uh, well, obviously this is kind of a, a global uh, uh, nuance for all of us right now because we were sprung on us so quickly. Uh, but yes, we can. We can do uh, either webinars like this with, with staff uh, to help with uh, training and so forth. Uh, and also the training tools that I mentioned earlier uh, do have modules for remote workers to, about securing your, your home network and how to handle that as well. Awesome, okay. Well, I don't have any other questions here. Is there anything else you guys wanna say before we wrap yeah, up? Let me return real quickly to the question about Microsoft Teams and HIPAA compliance and remember Brent's answer, which is uh, totally correct, is Microsoft Teams as delivered by default is not uh, really HIPAA compliant. However, with the correct licensing and if you set it up correctly and if you use it in a HIPAA compliant manner, and this is the big one, if you sign a business associate agreement, okay, with Microsoft, and that's the piece that most people that try to use it for HIPAA compliance have not done. You need to sign a business associate agreement with Microsoft so that teams will be covered under their HIPAA compliance. Do, does their technology tick all of the HIPAA compliant boxes? Yes, okay, it is a tier D which I won't go into that, but it's it's a a tested and and uh, approved platform with the contingencies that I just outlined, specifically that that business agreement being the big one. Awesome. All right. Well, as we wrap this up, I want to thank 
the folks there at Synergy Technology for taking time from their busy schedules to help us with uh, with some answers to some of these questions that, that we all have, things we're all having to deal with and work through right now. And, and again, um, one of the roles that your chamber plays is to help create an economic environment that allows prosperity to occur. And, uh, and, and these guys can help you protect that prosperity as, <laughs> as it comes. So, uh, hey, we know as we go through this, this crisis period that uh, we believe that together we're stronger. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're putting all this information out there for everybody. Uh, we believe that facts matter. So we want you to have the facts uh, as much as possible. And we know that we're going to get through this. Um, when this rocky period is, is over, we're going to come through it stronger than ever before. So uh, in the meantime, we're your partner and uh, we're doing everything we can to help you get through this as a business and an organization. Again, thanks to the guys at Synergy. And as a reminder, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online at longviewchamber.com. And again, for those of you who have listened live, uh, you'll receive an email later today or in the morning with a link to listen to again and or to share with others. So great information today. Uh, we, we do have some other webinars in the works. Uh, so be on the lookout for those. Past web webinars are also located on our website. You can find them there. So thanks again to everybody who participated. We appreciate you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.